see how that seems. But it all, I mean, it all takes a lot of work to, 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 you know, to, to be accurate for once, you know, I mean, this, uh, this whole editing process. And then my partner in climate system solutions, I mean, he wants to commercialize this and, and see how we can create, you know, a revenue generating function out of all this. Um, and he comes from the biofuel uh, sector, uh, so he's very interested in in uh, uh, creating biofuels. And the big thing there is low carbon intensity, um, which uh, would re which is an uh, an interesting idea to reward farmers who have already done the right thing. You know, a lot of these carbon uh, uh, schemes are really paying for farmers to do something different than they have done before. So they're now accumulating farmers. That leaves out all the farmers who have already done this for many years and who already have a carbon-rich soil. You know, and, uh, and so this, this carbon intensity score shifts focus on the carbon content. And I'm not sure, quite sure of the science. I have to check the, the science more. Uh, but it's, it measures the, the carbon intensity of the crop coming out of that soil. So a farmer who has been doing this for 20 years instantly gets a higher reward, gets a higher score, which then yeah, uh, create, uh, generates a higher return uh, in the market. That's the idea. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, the farm bill should contain a tax measure that benefits greatly farmers who have high so oil, soil organic matter and penalizes those who have dead soil. It's just like, it should be a very sharp gradient. Right. Yeah, same principle. Yeah. Can you get that inserted in the farm bill? Yes, I will. <laughs> get around it. <laughs> You're talking to all the right people. I mean, is there any motion like that anywhere near the farm bill? Yeah, there, there, there is uh, um, there's a lot of motion in there. Um, the, the challenge is to... To, to structure the carbon markets in ways that they make sense and don't just greenwash uh, and, and, and distribute rewards in a fair uh, manner. You know, that has been, that has been uh, uh, why these things don't really work so far. So this carbon intensity score, so my partner is all over this uh, uh, because it, uh, uh, it would give breathing space to the biofuel sector when they're mm -hmm. buying low carbon intensity uh, crops. Because when you really measure out what these biofuels uh, uh, generate, I mean, you put more carb, more calories in than you get out. So just you know, by the time if you if you uh, uh, figure everything that goes into the ground in terms of fertilizers and water and you know, the energy for the, the, the tractors and hauling and what have you, and then you convert this into biofuel, you know, the, the, the uh, energy you're getting out of it is less than what, what, got, what went into it. And so that's now becoming obvious and you know, can no longer hide it. So this carbon intensity score is one avenue. Yep. Uh, the other one is... Um, to, to uh, create an organic label that rewards uh, uh, certified organic products in the market. So you get you know, a higher a higher market price for it. Thank you. Um, I think that's part of the carbon intensity indicator thing. <clears throat> um, I, Anyone else? Uh, Rick, uh, Dave, you guys want to check in in the Neo books like context? Hey guys, uh, you know, just just came to uh, listen, hear what's going on. Uh, yeah, I saw some on the the biofuels thing. I saw somebody said something like, you know, oil has been it was compressed biofuels for you know millions of years, and that's why it's so intense. And this notion that we can grow it in a year and burn it the same year and have some kind of equivalency is is crazy. And it's like, oh yeah, it kind of makes sense. So I was like, common sense. <clears throat> we've been we've been burning millions of years of reserve. The idea that we can grow it in a year and replace it is, 
not going to look so good. I got a message this morning from my more conservative friend than me who lives in just north of the Columbia in Washington. Uh, and it was, I had sent him back, I had sent him last week uh, Al Gore's recent talk, which I thought was pretty good. Like Al Gore's angry and, you know, he talks about how COP got taken over by the oil interests and blah, blah, blah. And my friend uh, Scott came back and said, yeah, but oil production is at an all time high thanks to the US in the globe. And then he points to a whole bunch of other stuff. He says, is it even realistic to think that this is going to go away? And uh, I, I, there's some kind of new conversations that need to be held in the middle of all that. And I don't know who's, I wish I knew who's sort of, who's having the right conversation that people will listen to. So I don't know. It's depressing. Uh, and uh, any sort of news after COP? COP 28? Uh, Klaus, did anything interesting come out of it? Um, well, the interesting part is that for the first time, uh, there was one full day dedicated to agriculture, food and yeah. agriculture. And that uh, I think it's now up to over 150 countries signed a commitment to uh, to change the agricultural practices, you know, wherever that leads. Um, but there is now, now a clear recognition that uh, um, agriculture contributes uh, almost a third of global emissions. Uh, that's one line. And then at the same time, you know, it depletes our aquifers, uh, it pollutes watersheds, you know, it uh, creates uh, nutritional deficiencies. So you, you have a whole basket of stuff that all come into, into fuel for the first time. And Al Gore um, picked up on, uh, on, on agriculture. You know, I spent some time with the climate reality project um and he did you know a, a phenomenal summation i mean the agency that's uh working for him they actually uh, commissioned me to develop a strategic outline um and and uh uh ex extrapolated this into you know a six-hour presentation with interviews with uh, secretary of agriculture Vilsack and senator stabenau and others so that that was you know, pretty incredible because he is a phenomenal orator, you know, and and he has the ability to create mind pictures that uh, that are really uh, that really hit through. So so that was that was interesting. Today is a starting point, you know, for for agriculture to really take off uh, with the same level of intensity that you see in the energy sector. Let's just hope it goes further. I mean, is anybody picking up that banner and running with it? I mean, who who is the who are the most likely orgs of any mass of any scale who are who care about that and are doing something? Is it the Sierra Club? Is it like who? Sierra Club is actually super disappointing. You know, I think their funding sources uh, are, are compromising them. The, the Climate Reality Project. We have a strategy session with the ninety six chapters that belong to them this coming, I think, Thursday. Um, and they, because there is now a pause in the Farm Bill negotiations, um, the Farm Bill 2023 has been extended to 2024. Mm. So we have one year, you know, to recoup. And um, and so strategically, we need to now engage with farmers, 90% uh, of who vote Republican. Uh, because they just don't, they just don't have the connections. Now they're very, um, very emotionally tied to to the land. Um, you can't talk about climate change that has been seriously polluted. So you need to talk about soil. So we're developing talking points. You know where we can, so where we can uh, uh, advise the chapters. Very motivated people. I mean, there are literally thousands of members you know who are very excited about uh, talking to legislators and talking to uh you know uh, uh, people who who may make a difference um but create talking points that uh, get farmers interested and and explain to them how they are voting against their own interests by supporting republicans here you know? because republicans are actually against farm bill reforms 
that would assist small scale farmers to get market access, to get uh, financial support, to get money for ecosystem services and all of those things. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Rick, any progress or thoughts on your front? Excuse me. Yeah, um, you know, I, I've been sort of tracking things on LinkedIn from different perspectives on COP28, and it's really fascinating to see the diversity of perspectives on it, all the way from people who say we shouldn't be taking any oil out of the earth whatsoever, which is highly unrealistic, although it would be laudable if it was possible. Um, but um, somebody I've been tracking for a while who I've been following some of his posts on health, and he's the executive director of something called the World Health Innovation Summit. And um, I think they're trying to put a greater pre you know, presence of health, the health consequences of climate change. I haven't been tracking it closely, but I've just been tracking it through LinkedIn. And then on the uh, Substack uh, front, um, I'm still playing around with it, and I'm really enjoying using DALI. And I thought I would just do a very quick screen share of an image that I came up with. Um, it took, you know, fun and play games playing. Let me see if I can pull this up here a little bit. But anyway, this is the, the, the title of it is Ethics, Equanimity, Egalitarianism, How We Might Compose Poems and Tell Stories to Cultivate the Fairness Doctrine of equity governance. And um, I'm about uh, two thirds of the way through it uh, in terms of finishing off this blog post. One of the features it does have is you can send previews to people in advance to get feedback. And the other is, is to set up in such a way that if people are interested, or you have a group of people uh, collaborating, like a, a cohort of writers who, instead of going on their internal systems of sharing information, would go public. Uh, it might be interesting to see whether you might be able to create a, a mycelium network around a cadre of people who post on one place, but cross-reference their different uh, contributions. So um, this is work in progress. So I thought I would just share something that I was just working on this morning and came up with this visual image this morning. So that's me over and out. Um Thanks, Rick. And I think it was on this call last week or something something recent, uh, Pete or someone else mentioned Posse, P-O-S-S-E, -S -S -E, and Pose, which are basically approaches toward posting on your own site and then cross-posting all over the place elsewhere um, as a way of building the, yeah, the mycelial yeah. connections you were just talking about. Pete, if you could put those, re those uh, if you've got any links to that information, that would be great. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, he's already did. done it. No sooner than no sooner thought than done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is uh, I I'm new to the idea of posse, although I I you know have thought about the same thing. They've got a, a couple other I I don't even know how many there are, um, uh, but the acronym comes from a community called Indie Web, um, and they're um, it's a it's a fairly old organization. I, I used to hang out with some of these folks a, a long time ago. But the the general idea is, um, in it's it, it's actually before you know before folks like us started started talking about decentralization, um, or maybe it's maybe it's a, a couple iterations ago. I guess it was literally like twenty years ago they were talking about this kind of stuff and. Um, the idea of the indie web is that uh, you make your stuff, you own your stuff, and then you distribute it out rather than going to Facebook or wherever and contributing to their, you know, to their infrastructure. So um, as it happens, I'm going to, they've, they've got a in, uh, person in person uh, meeting this weekend in San Diego, and I'm going to attend. Um, it's their first uh, in person meeting since the pandemic, and it'll be mine too. Lovely. I had missed pesos. I've got pose and posse, but I missed pesos. So adding that. Thank you. David, I, I, I had joined to your meeting last week, I think on Friday, uh, about the landscape renewal uh, idea. Um, yeah, thanks for doing that. And I had to, I had to leave early, but uh, can you just sort of put a, a quick frame around what you're trying to do there? Uh, 
the notion is that we want to organize the intellectual assets that are going to support landscape regeneration in the commons. And I, in computing and the, around the internet, you would talk about building a stack. Um, and so I was using a stack metaphor for, um, or, you know, it's like, I was thinking it's like, we, we have other, you know, like it's a library, a library is where we put intellectual assets too, but a library is like, so you can find them and reuse them. The stack, you're improving them. You know, it's kind of built into this notion of the stack is that you're continually improving the, the tools. Um, and so, anyway, yeah, so that, that was, the thought was that landscape regeneration is going to be really important. If, if we're at all successful, we have to regenerate a bunch of landscapes. So let's just assume we're going to do that. And if you're going to regenerate a bunch of landscapes, we're going to learn a bunch and we're going to get better at it. And that knowledge is either going to be captured by, you know, commercial interests. It's going to be disaggregated and not very useful, or it's going to be organized and in, in the commons. So let's make sure it's organized in, in the commons. This is kind of the argument. Yay. Um, we, and go ahead, Klaus. So do you need, uh, do you need this to generate revenue? I lost myself. Um, that's one of the fun bits. So this the notion of the stack implies a business model. So people are, for some reason, there's a positive reinforcement cycle where people are using it and improving, it, using it and improving it, which I think is a business model. Um, so the, the, in some sense, the resources in the stack have a business model. And so something like WordPress is a pretty good example, I think of an open source commons with a business model. Um, so there's a whole bunch of people who make their living out of things associated to WordPress. Um, and, and in that is uh, a cycle that makes WordPress get better as you do it. Um, so we would somehow need to design the same kind of thing, I think, for landscape regeneration. Yeah. But I'm also assuming that's a, you know, in my mind, landscape regeneration is, in some sense, is it's tautologically profitable, right? Regeneration means that we have more value at the end than we did at the beginning, right? And the question then is somehow how do you allocate that 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 new value? And some of it should go to the people who helped create it, right, to do livelihoods and stuff. So there's going to be consulter, consulting firms and, you know, farmers and companies and, you know, in that system. We're selling services, you know, doing analysis, writing legal contracts, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, so somehow or another, the system needs to de deliberately incent them to improve the open source commons materials. Hmm. I don't know. Tell me if all this, if it, what, how much, which parts of this sound like bullshit, but that's how I think of it is that the, there, and one of the mistakes that one of the reasons to put this to say this out loud is that lots of people say, oh, we're doing open source, you know, and what they really mean is they opened a license, they really made a, made something available in, in the commons, but there is no business model, so it will not improve. And really, I think, is the improvement part that's critical. The stack has to get better. It has to get, be it has to get bigger, right? The stack will grow more and more level layers of, of intelligence will get added to it. And lower layers should improve and hopefully at least remain stable. Um, and, and a lot of the current stuff is like you throw around the words, but there's no concept of an actual improvement cycle. When, when I was you know, listening, <clears throat> when I was listening into the to the comments, what what came to mind uh, the, was a business model that is uh, the intentional community. Um, because they are, it's a very similar um, concept of basically selling ideas and know-how, um, and uh, by dividing the intentional communities into many subsections, right, into into modules, uh, but for by type, and then they are offering uh, training courses and training materials which you have to buy. But when you look at their website, um, it gives you, you know, uh, a broad entry, you know, into into this concept of intentional community, uh, and then you can zoom down into what you may be of interest to you, and then you can buy into it. 
So it seemed like when you when you think of um, landscaping, I mean, urban agriculture comes to mind as part of it. Um, and uh, um, so many, so many uh, uh, different approaches or different applications, right? So maybe that kind of segmentation would also uh, uh, help to 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 be more specific, you know, in in who uh, uh, to help and and with what. Does it make sense? Yeah, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen any of the intentional community stuff, so I don't, I don't know it at all. Um, yeah, and so I mean, and I'm using landscape as a proxy for like bioregion too, right? So not not just landscaping, but the but the notion of a an integrated it's a it's a physical location that has uh, economic and biological biodiversity and uh, social com 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 components, right? So I'm I'm thinking of I don't know you know Acapulco as a landscape, um, right? And so the notion that we would regenerate you know Puerto Vallarta or something like that is is kind of the, the level I think we should be thinking at, and um, which implies right a huge commercial interest um, with lots of money flowing through it, and, and also I think hopefully. I, I, there, I know Dorn had a good a word for like how open source works. It's like uh, I stuck it in the document. I think I can't remember. I can't remember the term, but but you know the contributions, the contributions don't come in your in your in the area you're competing in, right? You contribute to the areas that are you don't care about in some sense, right? You, it's the it's the infrastructure in the system that's easiest to have be held in the commons because because that's cost, not return. So if, if I can if I can lower my cost by contributing into the commons, I'm more inclined to do that. So I, and I think the Linux that's how the Linux operating system works, right? Nobody wants to build an operating system. They want the things operating systems do. So they want the cheapest operating system they can possibly get that does the things they need, so they can do the things they want, right? So IBM is willing to invest back into Linux because it's cheaper than not, right? And so I think we want to find a bunch of industry, you know, analysts make it's like people who are doing hydrology analysis. You know, we want them to use the hydrology analysis stack that has a regenerative flavor because it's cheaper than them building their own stack. And yeah, they're going to have to modify it so it suits the Columbia River. But then put that back in the stack. David, what do, you, what do you see as being the impact impact of using AI in more efficient ways to be able to enable that? Because um, I think AI, AI kind of makes it just gives it another order. Of I mean, I exactly. assume the stack concept is still useful in this yeah. context. Maybe it's not, but I think it's still useful. And yeah, then AI, I'm using it. Just I like it. it. Uh, that doesn't mean it's useful, but I'm 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 all in on on thinking and trying to explain stuff in in terms of stacks. And there, there's also a piece of conversation uh, with Pete I've been having a few times over about how do we visualize those stacks? Because because making your way up and down the layers is useful and interesting as an explanatory tool. And then focusing on one layer exclusively at a time then lets you sort of deepen and clarify what you mean by that layer of the stack. Uh, and there isn't, I, I have not found a, a visualization tool that lets me do that in any reasonable way. I really, and I think there's a notion of a stack of stacks, but but one of the I've talked to a couple like Hodgson's trying to do some AI tools, right? And one of the things he was pointing out is that his AI tool needs the stack, right? He needs to train it on stuff, so that mm -hmm. he needs this often a, a commons resource, you know, to enable the AI in the first place. In some sense, so I mean, positive this, feedback. Yeah, there seems to be two areas. One is how can AI more efficiently enable people to contribute? That's one. The other is to go in and how can AI help you search things in a way that makes it more efficient to extract? So it's both input and output. I don't know if there's any anything out there that uh, any of you techie knows that are wh where this is going, but I see that as an application. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Findability. Exactly. Uh, well, I, I struggle with translation. That. They're beginning to develop things, but they're very early stage about how to search electronic medical records for information. 
I tell you, it's a nightmare. You know, it's not easy. You waste so much time. So I'm looking forward to when AI will do all my dictation, all my notes, and I just talk to it. It'll prime me up on every counter so I don't have to go through the chart. It'll set it up. The patient will get it in advance. They'll know what they're expected. And I just have a pleasant chat navigating their health. But we're not there yet. Heck, you're not even at the point where you get notified if your patient leaves the emergency room. So and that doesn't require AI. <laughs> Well, it's patchy, but I, I do actually, with, as long as it's within the system. But if it's within outside your system, our system. They, they, leave somebody else, they leave somebody else's emergency room, you don't get notified. Yeah, well, they do have some cross linkages, but it's it's not easy to use. Yeah. Anyway, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but I mean, cost of this stuff. So part of the thing, and I don't know if you've looked at Dorn, that Dorn Cox book on agriculture, but I thought it was quite good. And the agriculture tech stack, I think, is filling in quite nicely and, and there's nice big chunks of it that are open source so i don't know quite how it will play out but you know there's energy into that and it's coherent i think um and i feel like agriculture is just one piece of landscape regeneration right and it may be the most advanced and we want all of landscape regeneration to start to look like what agriculture looks like is my thought so you know, I, I kind of want the Dorn's book to be just not just agriculture, but to be, you know, a broader kind of living systems um, frame, right? The, you know, like the, again, the organizing concept ought to be living systems, not the business of a farm. Uh, Dave, which which of Dorn's books? Um, I just put in the chat, How Soil Works, or is it The Great Regeneration? Let me, let me pull the right document here, sir. How soils work. I don't know if that's Dorn also, but I think it is. It's um, the Great Regeneration. It is that one. Okay, cool. Yeah. Busy day. The subtitle is Open Source Technology and a Radical Vision of Hope. Yep. I put it in the chat. And he does, you know, it really is a book that, like, if I was ever going to write a book, I want to write that book, kind of. You know, he talks <laughs> so about free competitive you, spaces. And... You could write the book about um, from the the. I mean, you you, sh you should write the book that you wish he had written about landscape. You know, landscape. Well, in some sense, that's what this concept paper follow on is. Yeah, it's just enough. like it's just kind of the taking these basic ideas, and I want them on landscapes, not just agriculture. Uh, and I want to operationalize them a little bit more. Is this, you know, is it's like this is what should happen? I feel like, I feel like the stack is tactful enough that we should ought to be able to start to do something with that. Um, and I, I was thinking, I was trying to, it was just dawning on me that it's a little bit like, um, you know, there's like uh, like Creative Commons uh, or you know the group of Creative Commons, right? Not just the licenses, but there's somebody's out there, you know, promoting and managing the licenses, and you could set up an entity but essentially that's tried to set out and you know facilitate the stack you know because you're negotiating it's not you're not going to build nobody's going to build the whole stack you're just going to try to re you know encourage standards and adopt new standards and you know funders to commit to the idea of funding the stack and you know those kinds of things i think it's more you know nudging the herd so, sounds like you dave well i mean I, you know yeah if i was if i had enough ambition i probably should do it myself yeah <laughs> you know, i wasn't so lazy <laughs> Would it would it make sense to define the stack, but and then develop what do you call it a branch uh, in more specificity, so you have an example? I I mean I think that I was just, it's just kind of you know that's been one of the thoughts is that um, that is a, that could be an outcome. It's like there's a organization to promote the the landscape regeneration stack, and you know most ideas like I was looking kind of through the stuff that. Um, Who's the uh, Jordan? Uh, Jordan Sukut? So, yeah. So I was looking through his wiki and stuff. And, you know, the, the notion is he's got a platform that he's going to build and it does everything, you know. And I don't think those ideas work very often. So <laughs> this is, this stack is not one group building. This group, the point, part of the point of the stack is everybody's building it, you know. Um, from different corners, and the, and the stack is kind of modular, so it enables the fact everybody contributing into it. Um, Jordan's actually got that vision. I, it, I'm not surprised it wouldn't come across in the writing, but um, he he always says, um, you know, 
if if it's not being built, I'll build it. But as soon as somebody comes along and is like, oh, I'm building that part or I'm building the other part, he's like, okay, let's, you know, you can do it or we'll, we can do it together or whatever. So I mean, I think one of the things is you don't actually get to decide what it's going to be. You, you know, and you're building it from the inside out, right? I mean, I don't think the folks, you know, I mean, Torvald didn't know he was building Linux when he started. The Linux folks didn't know that they were going to build LAMP, right? I mean, LAMP didn't know, right? I mean, yep. you know, all of this stuff, you learn it as, as you go downstream. But I think I'm fairly confident that in 30 years, there will be a huge body of knowledge that leads to landscape recharge. And a bunch of it's going to be codified in legal language and curriculum and software and data. And if more of that's in the commons, we prefer that. One of the, the really interesting um, things happening right now with the uh, uh, USDA here is the concept of urban agriculture, uh, meaning agriculture in an abandoned city lot, right? I mean, you have places in Detroit, uh, for example, which you know is a mess in many places where they are converting you know abandoned uh, lots into into gardens. And so USDA is making this big right now because so many of these opportunities are in areas that uh, are basically food deserts because you can't mm -hmm. put in a grocery store. you know a grocery store just gets plundered and you <laughs> wouldn't you know, so so the the there has to be a a ground up revival mm -hmm. of um, getting these folks to be food secure. You know, currently 44 million Americans are food insecure, and a lot of them are in these uh, food deserts, and urban agriculture could be uh, a revival mechanism. So when you when you look at this in terms of landscape, and it is a form of landscape uh, uh, design, you know, so that would be there's a huge need and demand for that part. I think that takes sort of much more of an ecological perspective. I'll just share an experience that I had here in Charlotte where I, I went to a, a, a registration to vote in an area that was um, as a poor turnout. I just, I just thought I would go to it. And interesting enough, they had a regenerative garden there. It was supported by a local community college. And they had people... Uh, teenage kids learning about regenerative agriculture. It was amazing. I thought, why why can't something like that scale? But coming back to a, a point that you know what what I was hearing um, was this notion of a, what they you know again I'm not a techie I just you know pick up the lingo which is you know the notion of a super app um, and apparently in Asia they're much more popular where it, it it's an aggregation of different things. So you don't have to go to the different apps. Um, so I don't know if there's any, uh, you know, what your thoughts are about a super app. So uh, Elon Musk off. is trying to turn Twitter into WeChat, basically, because everybody yeah. in the West is jealous of WeChat, within which you can live your entire life, as long as you don't mind the PLA and the, the, the CCP <laughs> snooping on your snooping on your behaviors. But but you can you can book a dog groomer, you can pay the dog groomer, you can take pictures of the dog groomer, you can re review the dog groomer, your friends can see all of that and then book the dog groomer. Everything can work within WeChat. And I think Zuckerberg and Musk and others have been like drooling over the mm -hmm. prospect of have, you know, having that kind of pervasiveness in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a good thing is an entirely different question. Exactly. Well, it depends on the purpose and the ethics. Yeah, for sure. And it's probably a different layer than where I'm thinking. It's like, I don't know if I'm thinking about the right layer, but again, my, I, my, I think the metaphor of Legos is much more useful. We want, what we're talking about are basically the bricks and maybe sets of bricks, and then you're going to build a super, right? So mm -hmm. there's some, so what happens I, in the conversations I hear, people talk about technology and they say, okay, well, what we want is all the people to have, you know, to be able to communicate with each other and coordinate. So therefore we're going to build Hilo. And Hilo is a user facing product, I would argue. And it has a, GSI, G, a GIS component and some communications protocols and things like that. The GIS component and the communications protocols would be in the stack. And then there's somebody who does a product and they take the pieces out of the stack and they make the product and they try to sell the product. But in my mind, the user, like you can imagine that the stack is a, is a, is a ball and there's accretions, new accretions growing around it. 
And the accretions tend to be commercial is my bet. And they tend to be products, right? And you want the ball to keep getting bigger, but the surface of the ball tends to be commercial. Anyway, that's how I interpret open source stuff. You don't see a lot of, you know, the, the, this open source isn't what's sold. It's what's used in the things that are sold. Um, or is there anything in our conversations that would lead to some sort of uh, neo book? And you mean in this kind of conversation? Yeah. Well, this any well this what, what's triggered by this or what's being said or beyond what's yeah, being yeah. said. That, that's a great question. Uh, I think a, what the dynamic that Dave is describing and that I'm jazz handsing and uh, we're sort of talking about here is a dynamic that I'm hoping NeoBooks plays a role in fostering, uh, benefiting, uh, bringing attention to, et cetera, et cetera. Because one of the reasons for NeoBooks is to create an environment within which we share what we know and we make it better mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, open source, open content is key to that. Uh, and liberating the content is really important in that process. So, um, so there, so there could easily be a neo book. I mean, I can easily envision a neo book that sort of makes these statements and makes them available in an open sourcey way and and is published as a book. You mean a neo book about a neo book? Yeah, yeah, a, a meta exactly. neo book. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I can imagine that. I mean, if this were to start to develop, I mean, for example, a book you could probably do right now a book about the agricultural stack. Right. Here's what exists already. Here's how right. people are using it. Um, here's how you where you find things. I don't know. Here's a tutorial for for GitHub. The AI is going to be really useful. That's what I was thinking. Translation. If the if I could talk to an AI and, and interact with GitHub, I'd probably be way ahead. So I don't really understand GitHub. You know. One of the one of the things that kind of strikes me is that we've got a lot of architectural ideas. Um, I, I'm certainly guilty of this, um, but not a lot of uh, just execution horsepower. Um, I wonder mm -hmm. if we could find universities or even high schools where where there's students looking for a project um, and would love you know, a mentor to shape, mentor men mentors um, to shape some architecture and, and especially the things um, like like Dave, it's super in, in, or Klaus, super inspirational hearing you guys talk about. Okay, you know, I've looked around, <laughs> I've looked a lot, I've looked for decades. This is the important thing right now, right? That's something that is really hard to see when you're inside a school, and it's like, well, I don't know what's important, you know. Um, so it seems like there's a potentially an, an opportunity to find some like feet on the ground kind of I can I can put in you know 20 hours or uh, over the or 40 hours over the next semester or something um, as long as you kind of tell me what's the important most important thing to be be doing um I had an update call with Johnny Giacomelli this morning and we had talked a year and a few months ago maybe a year and a half ago and he works uh, at MIT at the Supermind Project uh, Augmented Collective Intelligence and <clears throat> Just really just sort of interesting back and forth and interesting catching up with him, like good timing. And one of his tropes is, well, I don't, you know, why don't we know what we know? Which is a, a thing I love. I, I, I you know, uh, it's a it's a trope I love as well. Um and a piece of the conversation was sort of uh, a letdown because um uh, he's done a bunch more work than I have, way more, way more with corporates that are trying to do knowledge management and all that. And I'm going to paraphrase him badly, but but basically, they're not thinking out at the edge of what's possible at all. They're doing really sort of low scale, pragmatic stuff, uh, just trying to get around. And and he's not even sure they're either resourced or interested in the the more powerful conversation around what's possible and possible not with the invention of brand new magic but with the magic that's on the table right now. It's just, you have to yeah. think about it and organize it differently and behave differently. Um, and he he was originally pretty enthusiastic about Microsoft's Viva, whatever it's called. Uh, uh, hold on a second. Uh, Viva something, Microsoft. Microsoft Viva Topics. 
uh, when it first came out, he was really excited because he thought it might do something. And then it was like, eh, there's not much horsepower there. It doesn't, it doesn't do much. Uh, so I think that we're in an, we're, we're in an area that could be very juicy and fruitful. And we need to locate the orgs and the funders that really actually care about this and would like to take it someplace. And I, I had a conversation with Danny Hillis mid pandemic because I thought he'd be interested in OGM and all that. And we ended up, I ended up thinking like, well, the underlay project he's working on is kind of stuck on a couple technical issues. And there's this a whole bunch of, there's this whole funded community that's busy working on a very particular slice of what this looks like and it's kind of a little bit stuck there. Then I think that happens a lot. Um, so then we have these open source communities like the Fediverse and IndieWeb, which we've been, IndieWeb we've referred to a bunch here, um, which are trying the other way of doing this, which is like, hey, we're just a bunch of people interested in this with our own little startups and are doing our own stuff, trying to collaborate our way to it. And that's sort of working, but sort of not. So I, I'm just puzzled about where the leverage points are that we could actually uh, get more done, get more resources to do the things Pete's pointing to and Dave's pointing to without getting stuck on small architectural um, hurdles. Sorry, just free association. I mean, one of the things that makes me think, Jerry, is, and I swear we did the stuff we talked about for that, that IBM paper is still pretty useful. But mm -hmm. it's like, it's, and maybe this is a, maybe this is a book of yours. Like, I feel like the, the stuff, like, I listened to Zane Gill do a talk the other day um, about kind of collaborative intelligency things and stuff. And a lot of her examples are the same examples we were given 15 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like Wikipedia is so cool and Linux is so cool. And they are, they're so cool. Right. And I would argue we just haven't done them very often. You know, I don't think we know how we built Wikipedia kind of. And we know it exists now. So 20 years ago, it didn't exist. 25 years ago, it didn't exist, right? And couldn't exist. Now it does exist, but we really still don't know why. Right. And we don't know how to do it again, yeah. I would argue. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that was kind of what it was like. I was feel I feel like a lot, and this is a little bit of Dorn's book. It's like, you know, he's pointing at all this cool stuff and saying this is what we should do. And I would argue we don't know how, and that's okay because we haven't done it very much. You know, it was like I was I was I was talking with uh, Mitra, the guy he used to do a lot of Gopher, uh, and uh, he he said, you know, it's it was it's just an accident. I said, well, penicillin was an accident the first time, you know, and sometimes <laughs> we got good at it, right? And so the, we we've had the accidents, but we haven't had the get good at it part. I feel, and so mm -hmm. I, I do feel like so. I mean, there is a book that starts out with all the amazing stories of open source, you know, and and the value of Linux, and you know, like it must be billions and billions of dollars, right? Um, and how it's, the Linux Foundation is much bigger. There's many more open source projects. You can see this stuff is working, and then it's got a couple of paragraphs on how it happened, and those are getting fuzzy, I think. But you know. But at least it's the beginning of the structure about how did we, how do we do these things and how do, how do these business models work and how do the reinforcing cycles get started? And I don't know. I mean, are they all some grad student in a dorm or, you know, could we be more deliberate? Than that? I mean, you know, the and, and like with the NSF investing money in organizations, open source ecosystems, that's a really interesting experiment, I think, right? And they're going to learn a ton about how to build open source ecosystems if they can fund a couple hundred of them. Pete, jump in. I think the, I'm sorry, oh, Pete, I'm sorry, you're, I have your hand up. All right. No worries. Um, uh, really well said, Dave. And I, I had to chime in a little bit, not not to disagree, but um, I know a little bit of why we have Wikipedia. Um, and um, there's, there's a couple different reasons I could go into, but one of the biggest ones is we had a uh, world book encyclopedia and the encyclopedia Britannica uh, before that. So it, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but the couple people who wanted to build an online Wikipedia, online, online ex encyclopedia, excuse me, I can't even say encyclopedia anymore. Um, uh, they were able to describe it to everybody else as well, see that thing over there. I just want the online version of it. So that's like, I don't know, 40% of it right there. So one of the challenges that we have now um, is that when you when you try to build something that hasn't existed yet, or you know, is 
like envisioned but not actually made practical yet there's a bunch of practical stuff that you have to solve to get to to be able to put encyclopedia britannica together you know um what's the you know what's the uh, editorial uh, voice uh what goes in and what goes out of encyclopedia britannica so as wikipedia got more more and more viral and more and more people were contributing to it it was a godsend for them to be able to say well <laughs> look over there that's something that's been around for decades and, and centuries and i want that except i want it to be different in these ways right not having that touchstone not being able to describe what you're trying to do is a real drag it creates a lot of friction especially on collective intelligence and collective action hi boss yeah I, i'm just uh i'm just trying to wrap my mind around where uh, this could be going and the the uh i mean what i've been doing with um, my new book here is basically develop sort of a meta level perspective uh on on a system right so describing and mapping uh food as a system and where that where uh, what are the core influence factors what does it take and I'm just now in phase two, I'm still stumbling around where, you know, we can't really change anything because the system is resistant to change. And why is this and where is that? So before, uh, uh, before moving into very specific ideas of implementation, um, you know, you sort of have to lay out the map and then uh, you can go into so now, so I'm sort of moving now into, okay, here are things that we can actually do. And that's already what's already out there. And that's already in debate. These seem to be the most promising uh, ideas, you know, that, that actually uh, uh, have, have uh, a good chance to gain traction. But in order for them to gain traction, here is the infrastructure that needs to be in place. I mean, when you talk about low carbon intensity scores, well, what does that mean? Who's going to buy these products? Who's going to pay premium for it? Right. So then, and and how do they get distributed? So you're looking at all these complexities, and so when so so uh, la landscape restoration, you know, is is a section that has you know very broad application, um, but in order to so it needs, first of all, the definition, what do we all mean by it? What's all included here? Um, you know, what are the, what are the most uh, uh, obvious uh, stumbling blocks that prevent you know, a transition into a regenerative form of landscaping? And then which one, what's the low hanging fruit here, where if we impact it, uh, it would really make a difference? Right, which is why I put out there uh, the idea of urban agriculture because that is landscaping and people get to call food you know while they are restoring uh, landscapes and, and so, but there are others obviously so so I, I I just think there is a progression in thought you know that uh, that uh, uh, needs to be mapped out but always with the intention of where can we take this. You know, where, I mean, what I call, where's the low-hanging fruit here where we can really make an impact and people will get it, you know, and, 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 and embrace it. So, you know, there's a school program where, they, you know, USDA is now, like here in Bend, the school is super active in uh, talking about food and they have a garden, you know, where they uh, show kids how to grow food and where it actually, carrot actually comes out of the ground, you know, kind of thing. Um, and and so 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 to to accelerate that and blow that up and make it make it uh, uh, part of our you know more common sense understanding of the world around us, those are things that could be really helpful. So I'm I'm just always trying to get sort of rubber on the road. You know how do you how can you actually make this thing work? Love that, Go ahead, Rick. As you were talking, I was doing some searching. I, I sent a message to somebody a couple of months ago. I never got a reply from him. He was the Dean of Behavioral Sciences 
and communication at uh, Pfeiffer University. And I started searching around Charlotte itself, looking at who, who, who could you potentially, you know, co-opt. And one of the things that, um, that need, what, what's needed is horsepower. What I mean by horsepower is you need a lot of young people, you know, partnering with academics, departments, you know, it could be social innovation departments, it could be social media departments, where you could uh, maybe co-opt a, a few faculty or identify a few faculty members uh, who could come to a, a presentation on the potential of neobooks for learning. And I mean, it could flip. I mean, having spent my career in academia, it could flip the paradigm upside down. And a way in which it would be beautiful <laughs> would be fun. You get academic credit for it, number one, and that, can, that may take a little while, but it does, it can happen. Number two is you publish these things without having to go through publishers because they're very expensive and it's very difficult to get, if you're not part of the university, it's very difficult to get access to a lot of publications because of their, of their payment walls. So, um, you know, it, it's a question of trying to imagine where you could potentially link up with people to create a new way of learning that would uh, capture uh, universities and, and even high schools for that matter. So, my, 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 I'll, I'll put out a challenge and see whether other people are up to it. Try and, try and identify somebody from your local community or department, whatever it is, just to see if they're interested in the idea. But before we do so, we need to have a little bit of a document say what the potential of new books are to see if they might be interested in it. Because you have to think about how you're going to cultivate this network of learning. And tapping into universities is a good way of doing it if you can make the connections. Go ahead, Dave. Over to you. You're still muted. I was thinking. Uh, I was going back to you, Klaus, uh, around this, the like the, the your book and stuff. So, so what? Just I want to make sure that we're not doing the having a language problem that around landscape. That to me, I'm using landscape like uh, watershed or bioregion um, as in a large kind of. Uh, um, uh, a, a spatial decision making, a spatially defined thing where you have agriculture and commerce and living uh, humans, human people living, right? So, so it's, a, it's a sufficiently complex uh, region, um, hopefully defined with a living systems mentality, right? So, um, and and so I was thinking about the book. So like, and to me, the stack, the stack manages. I would call, I've been using the word technology, but it confuses people because they think of computers. But to me, the technology is um, a reusable idea, right? It's an idea we can put in. So your book, I would argue, is trying to describe these ideas. So you're trying to help people think through this process. And when you, if, for that book to be a technology, I have to be able to reuse your book in some sense. So I think the AI jumps right to that, right? So the AI is a really interesting technology for exploring your book. But you could imagine also that there's a you know a website that helps you go through and categorize people's statements by the spiral dynamics colors or something, right? And and that's a tool that they, they can they can then use to evaluate whatever they're thinking about. And that tool can be made better, right? As you, you know, as the as it captures more data from how people use it, it, it improves, I don't know, something like that. So the technology, it's not only is it, the technology can be reused, it can be improved. So what we want is actionable stuff that we're putting into the commons that is used and then reused. And I think one of the things I don't really talk about in the paper, but I think it's probably true is to the extent that that stuff has a regenerative flavor that leads us towards positive, out positive some outcomes, leads us towards living systems outcomes, has that as its intellectual design, you will tend to drive the entire system in a regenerative fashion. So there's a there's kind of a, a second level of statement under there. It's like, you know, the net, the internet has a philosophy that underlies it, right? And if you're using the internet, you're kind of abiding into the philosophy to some level. I mean, people are still finding that, but, but you know, there's a, it's a pressure anyway in the system. Um, so we want these, these, these improved, these ideas that are being used and being improved to have a regenerative, a regenerative tendency. That, does that make sense? So the book then is the beginning of the process, but when the ideas become reusable is when you get to the technology step. Um, thanks, Dave. 
Um, I'm thinking sort of along the lines of what several of you have just been saying. Um, so I put my notes in the chat. Um, Rick, I, I think we all want to change big institutions and big entities like the US and the UN and, and agriculture and all that. But I have this funny feeling that huge institutions are really, really hard to change. Every now and then they change, but but mostly through being bludgeoned by a, a blunt instrument. Um, a one, one way to make institutions change is to get so many people to start doing something alternative that the institution has to shift toward the alternative or the alternative just undermines and eats the old institution. Uh, and I think it's interesting here also to, to see large scale historic changes and to study them for, oh, how did that happen? How did this happen? So one of the ways that I, I think is um, really fun is to take the notion of bioregions or watersheds and use those as a, some new fake governance structure and say, hey, we're going to start behaving as if there were political boundaries or useful boundaries along watersheds. Wouldn't that be cool? We're just going to pretend. It's just a game. Don't worry about it. Um, but we're going to create collaborations and maybe currencies and maybe other sorts of things that operate along those boundaries and let people try them out. And we're going to uh, uh, make really useful and usable in there uh, Lynn Ostrom's eight points for managing uh, commons and other kinds of ideas that can be implemented so that if you wanted to implement Ostrom rules, you could do so more easily than going and looking up, looking it up and trying to read a couple of papers and building it all from scratch by yourself so that you could pick a, a piece of the stack. Basically, the Ostrom principles would be an application in the stack that would influence different parts of the stack and you could sort of plug it in and, and, and implement it uh, or instrument it, the kind of the way I'm thinking about instrumenting ideas uh, in different ways. Uh, and then some of these things would be new concepts like watershed, bioregion, uh, commons. What are you talking about? That's excellent because the moment you get people talking about how to how to frame the issue differently, you're coming in orthogonally or from the side of what the institutions have have been built to do that are so resistant to change that have so many special interests already on board, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's kind of doable. And then the question is, do you need to provide economic incentives like the you know, I would love to see a tax rule that says if you deplete soil organic matter, you're going to pay a large penalty. If you improve soil organic matter, you get a you get a negative income tax. You get a benefit. You got actually get a subsidy from the government. That'd be fabulous. I'd I'd love to see something that does that. And that is economics at work. I think a lot of people who are libertarians would be like, well, okay, that sounds like a reasonable rule. A lot of uh, people in agriculture would be like, well, screw you. You're penalizing me for industrial farming. And I don't know how you overcome that barrier, but that's a piece of the of, of the thinking here is how do you make it really easy for them to cross the bridge? How do you make it easy for them to transition how they farm, what they do, et cetera, et cetera? All of these are really thorny, thorny problems, but, but that's kind of the systems theoretic piece of what I think we're all talking about is how, how do these things work together and how do we do the little moving parts that are necessary for these things to work better? Go ahead, Klaus. See y'all later. Um, see you, Pete. Thank you. See you, Pete. Yeah, the, the, I think what I, what I would like to insert you know, into the discussion here is that the need to consider socioeconomic realities that are also part of a watershed or a bioregion. Um, and you can't really change anything unless, uh, productively, unless uh, the socioeconomics are, are considered as part of the design. And and it's really missing in in most every conversation. Yeah. Um, the the we, we can talk about regenerative agriculture and and in most every conversation there's like this pretense that we're talking about a national system or a global system. When in all reality, and, and you 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 there, there are things you just can't apply to certain socioeconomic environments because each community is unique. Yeah. Uh, uh, in in terms of the people who are there, the power structures, the regulatory structures. I mean, all of those things play play a role. And then also preferences, right? I mean, cultural uh, preferences uh, related to food, you know, what you like to eat, and so on and so on. So, so to me, this is uh, this is just a huge part of the discussion uh, in 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 the design 
of a regenerative environment. And it's, sorry, Rick, I'm going to stick it. And to me, that's why I want a landscape lens. Because I think if, we, if we're talking about regenerative ag and we're only talking about individual farms, we never get to regeneration at sufficient scale. And we're not able to do the transactions that I think Jerry's talking about. Because it, it, it implied here is that, you know, there's a benefit downstream from not polluting, but the farmer doesn't get paid for that benefit. Well, what if you could actually pay? You know, what if there was a contract or something? I don't know. So how do we open up those kinds of opportunities, right? So, but you don't have that transaction until you start to envision things in a, in a scope that includes the, you know, the resort and the farm, you know, and that's why like Playa Viva, I think is such a fun, fractable model, right? Because you got, you got the resort owner at the beach and he's got a farm and he's also talking to the people way up the river, you know, and that's that he's planning that whole watershed. And that's the level of planning I think we should be looking for. Uh, Kevin Jones is doing a lot of stuff like that. Uh, around the Swannanoa River and near Asheville, North Carolina. So he's got feet on the ground in communities, uh, in particular underrepresented communities, and they're doing the work. Uh, it's not all consonant with what we're talking about, but it's very much real. Um, good stuff. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I just want to uh, touch on two things. One is the pragmatics of what uh, David was talking about. What would that look like? And the second is, what are the learning systems that can actually enable that to uh, to occur more effectively over time? So you have the learning, and then you have the practice. Uh, just to return to your point about Jerry, I, there was no way I was thinking about changing institutions. All I was thinking is developing allies, open-minded people within academic institutions across things, right. because over time that can incrementally lead to a you know potential exponential. So. Uh, when I was saying that, I, was, I wasn't I was even thinking about that, well, <laughs> just yeah. to let you know. Yeah, thank you. And I think that inside of each of these institutions, these are they're not monolithic, and there are people who are thinking no. ahead, and there are people there who are, are trying to change them. There are lots of people. Yeah. How do you find those people and drag them into a, a conversation where they can share what they know and start to plot together? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've been outreaching uh, locally, and I'll, I'm going to try a little harder. And see whether, I mean, I think you just have to start, find out who's in your community, find out if somebody knows somebody. It's all through yeah. personal connections. Cold calling is difficult, as you well yeah. know. Um, and see whether you can make connections that way. Because, um, you know, if you're not, you're not preparing the learning systems to support this, then, and we have to improve our learning systems as well. Right. So, Rick, are you in Charlotte? Did I miss, I miss a transition here? No, 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 no. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. But I thought you're normally in New York, right? Oh, no, I was in Rochester, upstate New York. Yes, yes. Ah, okay, okay. Yes. All right. So I, I didn't I, realize you were in North Carolina. Yeah, I am indeed. Are you in Charlotte temporarily or? Like... Oh, no, no, no. We've moved here. We've okay. moved here now. When did you move? Uh, wow. getting, when did you move? Uh, getting away from the Northeast winters and uh, grandkids here. Ah, Grandkids are the great attractor. Grandkids are the great problem solver globally. I think that if we can- <laughs> We if have we can to start young, unified, start young. <laughs> if we can harness the grandparent, grandkid link for the world benefit, Yes, yeah, exactly. There's a big thing. Intergenerational learning, yeah, absolutely. There's a big thing there. There's a lot of power there. Mm -hmm. I call them terrorists. My, I have three little girls. <laughs> <laughs> Are they close? Are they close to your class? Are they in bed? No, they're in Nashville. Oh, so okay. twice a year for a week, and by the time we leave, we are like done. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, my two grandsons, by the way, are just four houses down, so we don't have oh. the benefit of distance. <laughs> nice. You must have hit the right symbol there on your yeah. On your back. So, so yeah, in, <laughs> in Sonoma, this does balloons. Uh, uh, this, this does confetti. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, That's crazy. This, this gives you a thumbs up. No. This gives you a thumbs down. This yeah. gives you uh, fireworks. <laughs> and then my, my favorite, I don't think this does anything by itself, does it? No. But this gives you laser light show. Nice. So See, how do you get the what's... special effects? How do you do uh, it? You upgrade your Mac OS to Sonoma. The you must have done it because you just had both. Do you want to yeah. do one Yeah, I fun? did. Yeah, I, I know, I know, but so you, so know. you don't you don't know that you're having those. Yeah, that should work. You might need to have your your hands closer to your head. There you go. Uh, done. Oh, done. Ah! 
Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Thank you. I've seen the light. I've seen the light. I, I have an update pending. I should see it. To go, go now. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Upgrade to Sonoma. All right. And it shows up. It shows up by default. It's on. It's weird. And then my little uh, on my toolbar right now. There's a little uh, green video icon, which now has a. It's a video icon that now has a green square around it. If you click mm -hmm. on that, it lets you tune these things and see what the special effects are. You can also turn on a couple modes. So, for example, I think mine are turned off now. So for example, uh, studio lighting uh, dims my background. So this oh, is stu nice. called studio light. And then portrait uh, blurs my background. So mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm turning portrait mode on and off. So I want the middle finger effect. We have to uh, wait for, you know, so this is when you open source it, you get. That'd be great. I, I don't I don't know that doesn't Did anything. you try the middle let's, finger? Let's give it a try. That's the wrong one. Um, Maybe double. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Maybe double middle it's finger. Not... No. no, this is Apple. This is the same people that like won't let you say shit in your text messages. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Well, um, I would say next week, let's keep conspiring on how to make this thing sort of come together and be more a thing. Because I, uh, uh, neo books aren't there to write more books. Books are bait to get people to go under the book and participate and communicate about exactly. what we know and to make mm -hmm. it accessible instrumentable, useful, all that kind of stuff, more findable. And, learn, and, and, and learning communities. Exactly. And yeah. part of the conceit is that if that happens well, then scientists, students, journalists, policy wonks, yeah, etc., exactly. will collaborate through the shared yeah. artifacts online. Exactly. So that's the goal. I've got, I don't know, Jerry, you've got, I've got like a, I'm not sure it's a neo book topic, but I've gotten a little bit inspired recently thinking about the regeneration pollination events. Yep. So this is the speed networking where we just do one-on-one -on -one networking. Yep. And the notion was that you need a strong network and we can create this service that just networks people, right? right. And we'll create lots of edges. And sometimes those edges will be really valuable and sometimes they'll rot and you know, whatever, but we're just creating edges. Yeah. And, and it's worked okay. We're, we've created some edges, but but it's never grown much and I think it ought to grow. And so I've been trying to think of like what it what it is and what it does. And so I've been trying to kind of, and then I think there are some other metaphors we've seen in like in, over the internet where you're focused. I, I want to switch to be from being like our events come to our regeneration pollination and switch it to being a gift to other organizations. So we're going to have Lyft Economy and their MBA ne next month, and we're going to have a regeneration pollination, which is a celebration of Lyft Economy. So we're trying to bring energy to them. And I was thinking maybe it's a little bit like the Olympic torch, where we're going to run through cities with a torch right. and we're gather attention as you go or something. Or yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm looking for kind of a metaphor or an explanation. Is there something in here that about, so it's not a thing in itself. It's a service to the sector. Right. Um, but it is collecting energy and sharing and distributing it, bring, bringing it along and delivering in the next place, something like that. Um, so so um, I, I'm getting your invites. I just don't don't make it to them because I've got. Well, exactly. Yeah. They're usually Friday. You're not alone. They're usually Friday afternoons, I think. Um, uh, yeah, a couple of times a month. But, yeah. And partly I come to them because it's just speed dating. I would get to meet a couple interesting people and that would increase the number of things I need to do. Because it's like, oh, <laughs> I'll follow up on that, or you know, and I know too many people as it as it is. Yeah, yeah, um, you're probably not the right target. Yeah. One of, well, one of my problems is actually managing the simple requests that come in from people I've met over time who are like, "Hey, this is interesting," and I'm like, "Oh, I'm curious. I love interesting things." So I have formed too big a filter that fills my bit, mm -hmm. but that's not important here. I think yeah. one of the one of the interesting things would be, and this might be too much work, Dave, but. If people, when they meet up, were to write either a testimonial for each other or a description of each other or help each other perfect their presence online, if there were some other artifact left over from regeneration pollination events, then two people met and had a nice conversation and now they know mm -hmm. about each other, which I think is the only benefit that you're currently creating. And I'm thinking yeah. here, I'm thinking here of the map, I'm totally forgetting his name. Robert something or other is using Kumu to do a beautiful social graph. Um, Ben I'm, Roberts, maybe. Ben Roberts, thank you. Ben Roberts, uh, Robert, that's why Robert came out. So, so Ben Roberts is using Kumu to do a social graph. If every regeneration pollination uh, meeting resulted in a couple more nodes in Ben's social graph or the big fungus or some other place in a standard in a in a knowable format that was easily machine readable, or if 
those interactions resulted in each individual participating having a really great web page that was their home that was their profile on the web that they showed other people like hey if you want to know more about me come here and that page is my outward presentation of the world and it shows you my connections into the, whatever i don't know what that is and i don't know how to make it such a lightweight task that everybody be happily doing it because there's so much benefit <clears throat> from doing it but but because it's only i'm going to meet for me because it's only yeah i'll meet two or three new new people um, or I'll meet five new people, two of whom I really actually want to stay in touch with and want to follow up with. That's too low a benefit and potential cost follow up for yeah. for the the effort. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Well, two maybe think of two things. One is that we should like do a session or something where like you and Hodgson talk about your problems, or I don't know. There must be a, find a couple more of you Uber networkers because he he was saying that he created GRC to to handle that problem. Because he felt like the overhead of connecting people was too high. Yeah. And he was trying to figure out how to automate it. And that right. was like one of the things, one of his notions was the GRC stack. Well, one um, of the motivations for my retreats, one of the motivations for my retreats was I meet a whole bunch of really smart people who were well intentioned. I, I don't get to see them often and they don't get to meet each other. So let's yeah. rub them together. So in some yeah. sense, regeneration pollination is in the same exact spirit. That's interesting. Well, and so the, and the regeneration pollination, I guess, probably isn't targeted at you. It's targeted at other people who don't yeah. have as many connections. Less, less, less networked, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, sure. I guess part of what I was trying for is, and maybe this isn't even possible, is that there is, in some sense, as the if the regeneration sector is forming, yeah. I think it is. I think there's evidence for that. Yeah. Then yeah. the network will get stronger, but we need it. You know, we want to accelerate that. And, it, and it's also, uh, it's very confusing because we, there's so many words kind of, you know, it's like people are in it and they don't know they're in it kind of. So some of the regeneration pollinations are deliberately to part, you know, like let's get people to talk to Lyft about their MBA program. Right. So there is kind of an introduction implicit, I think, in this. But we were thinking, they still think it ought to be done like every major conference ought to do this, right? So the people yeah. who are coming to a conference, to listen to people on stage, have a chance to meet a few of other folks at the conference before they go, you know, that kind of thing. And I've seen a few um, conferences do that reasonably well. Uh -huh. Okay, but, well, that would but, be, but very few. But if we could do it for the, all the conferences, then we continue to carry the flame through the system. I guess is, I yes. don't know. I'm, I'm, I haven't gotten this yet, but I'm trying to figure out if there's a thing in there and how you would say it and how we would market it. I guess. Well, is part of it. also, also, is there a persistent space where everybody can share what they're seeing and what they're knowing? Which comes back to this, you know. Then you're a platform, and yeah, I, no, we've avoided whole, that. Whole know? bunch of questions, but then, yeah. but then. There could be RC for regeneration uh, 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 pollination. Sorry, RP. There, there, there could be RP birds of a feather sessions at each conference that's happening that's interesting. And then those people could be digesting what was interesting at the conference and feeding it back into the platform, into the network. And then mm -hmm. everybody could vicariously benefit from everybody's participation and absorption of new ideas and new people into the network. But as it is, so what if it's not? But it's not our network. It's the the net. We're it's trying to support networks. the network. Totally. So so everything I just said, think of it as just protocols where anybody else can instantiate it the way they want on their network. No problem. Uh, yeah. Okay. But but there isn't enough digestion and sharing of what we learned, and it doesn't go into a more permanent place. One of my big beefs is that we're drowning in the info torrent, and every day somebody invents some new thing that has a channel or a torrent, and there's no place to put the good stuff. And the reason for the reason I love the brain, the reason for the big fungus is that it's a place to put the good stuff. That well, in this case, the, I would argue the place you, you do it in LinkedIn. You go to LinkedIn and you connect. You know, nah. you meet somebody yeah. like you connect on LinkedIn. Yeah, that, but, but that's, that's that's all. We're just doing a little micro inter I, intervention. I know. We're not trying to do a big intervention. Yeah, I don't know. LinkedIn, to me, LinkedIn that's is the, missing somebody. And I want to recreate LinkedIn. Anyway, thanks, thanks, Rick. So I didn't mean to take you guys off on this. No, train, that's okay. But I was, I was wondering in some sense if, if, See you uh, next class. Yeah. if See you. the networking effect is overlaps at all kind of with what you were talking about with for the book effect, I guess. Yeah. Um, and and LinkedIn is where, you know, LinkedIn kind of owns the resume and owns the business social graph, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right. Those two things it's doing really well. Then there's a hundred things it's not doing well. It's kind of bludgeoning its way into being a publishing platform, even though it doesn't mm -hmm. do that all that well. But now it's like a lot of people are writing a, a lot of people it. trust it more. Yeah, you lose exactly. Twitter, you go to LinkedIn. Exactly, and yeah. it and it doesn't have. It's interestingly, it's avoided the problems that Facebook has and that some of the that Twitter has. Yeah, I don't know how, but I don't, I don't know how it's avoided yeah. most of the controversy of all that. While it's, not being very good. 
Yeah. One that's zealously protected its social graph because they think that's the crown jewels. So it doesn't mm -hmm. let people come in and like use that well. There's no, you yeah. know, it's weird. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. But thanks for reminding me of Ben Roberts. Uh, I've yeah. Yeah. No, and I haven't seen his Kuma thing in a while. I mean, I, I kind of look, we, one of the guys that was doing the, some of the regeneration pollination design uh, back three years ago, what was wanted to, what, you know, like ours, the slug line is something about deep networking. It's like, right. What the fuck is deep? I don't even know what that is. And he has, he built like an air table that people were supposed to sign up to. And so Vincent, to Vincent, and... Vincent Arena has, uh, you was using air table and switched over to something else, bubble or something else, but he's got uh, catalyst, which is organizations and individuals. That's a big directory as well. And he's working with uh, Wendy McLean, who's uh, an OGMer, and the two of them had been doing a lot of stuff. But I, I don't know what where it's at now. I haven't. And then I think I think Vincent likes like Carolina, who's been doing a lot of the GRC stuff, started dating Vincent. So okay. they were like, I don't know, it's kind of it's like it's funny little. I, mean, oh. I don't know who Vincent is, but I know Carolina pretty well. So. Yeah. Uh, well, but the and the and again the and I don't think I care that the information is preserved because I think the connection is what matters. I think so. Both. If, if you're two people, yeah, pro I mean, there must be something at the at the margins of both of these kinds of things. Yeah. But if if you find the two people that you're interested in, and you're a normal person, yeah. you connect with them, and then you're connected I, with them, and I, then I agree with that. Um, and I and I think that the volume level or the relevance level on what gets saved more permanently is really important because if somebody's just like spewing all their notes and everything they're everything they touch, it's it's too much and nothing is findable. But if somebody gets good at finding the shiny nuggets that are like in the field, polishing them a tiny bit and putting them in a in a more permanent place, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And it may be a task that a minority of people do. Just like there's a very small number of people who actually edit Wikipedia. Like everybody yeah. uses it. Very few people edit it. Very yeah. few. Yeah, very yeah, few. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, that's great because it still creates this common asset. Yeah. So. All right. Well, it's great to talk to you. I don't mean to take Same your interview. So, oh, so no. we'll be, we're coming up. We're heading out back out west. We'll be in um, Berkeley as of uh, December, January 1. Are, are you going uh, back to the same neighborhood, same building? What are you doing? Well, no, I wish. You know, no, we're going to be we're going to be in Berkeley. Um, okay. Kind of close to the field work. I'm, I mark everything by breweries. So pretty close to field works, I think. So. Excellent. Okay, good. Good. That's <laughs> but, good to see. Uh, and we'll have extra bedrooms and stuff. So you guys, Love that. You guys, oh, that's great. Come, come stay. Thank you. And give Claudia my love, please. Will do. Will do. Thank you. Take care. Love day. Love, love.